Thanks for joining us for this uh, first edition of the four-part series of uh, freeze drying. Um, this first section is going to be a basic introduction, kind of get everybody on the same page, and then as we move through the series, we'll get into more advanced topics uh, in regards to thermal characterization, glass transition temperatures, how we determine those, and then moving into how do we use those to develop an optimized <coughs> an op cycle for freeze drying. All right, so what is freeze drying or lyophilization? I use that term interchangeably. So lyophilization is the process we use to remove water or another solvent, which we'll talk about as we go along, from a product or formulation at low temperatures. And that's the key here. Um, we're doing this at sub-zero temperatures. Now, there's no reason to think that we couldn't take um, a product at room temperature and put it in an oven at warm temperature to remove the water that way. But by freeze drying, we do that at sub-zero temperatures, thereby avoiding thermal degradation of certain uh, sensitive molecules that we may be working with. We do this through a process of sublimation, which we'll talk more about as we go along and what that term actually means. Some of the system components, which you'll see on almost every freeze dryer, there's got to be a vacuum pump. Um, vacuum is actually the driving force, or the change in pressure is actually the driving force of freeze drying. Um, and we'll talk more about that again as we go along. So we've got to create a, a high vacuum, low pressure system within the chamber to get freeze drying to occur in what we call bulk flow. Okay, we want to be, make sure we're doing this in the most efficient manner. Temperature controlled shelves, again, this is uh, not an absolute necessity. Um, there are people that are doing freeze drying in non-temperature controlled shelves, but generally for pharmaceuticals, diagnostics, the tissue industry, we are using uh, shelves uh, with thermal fluid in them that we can, you know, control <coughs> and monitor control the temperature of those. Um, there's got to be a condenser. So the condenser is a coil or plate that's very, very cold, lower than the product temperature, located somewhere away from the product. So when we do generate the water from the freeze drying process, the water naturally migrates um, down to the condenser and collects away from the product. Temperature monitoring devices, this is critical. Um, controlling temperature and or pressure is uh, very important in freeze drying. So there's various positions uh, along uh, in the instrument that we're monitoring temperature and pressure, also measuring the temperature of the product itself, especially during development of a freeze drying process. There's got to be a, some sort of bleed valve, um, especially if we're trying to, to control the chamber pressure. So a, a vacuum pump, when we turn a vacuum pump on in a process, um, it, it just keeps cranking and bringing the pressure down as far as it can go. So to balance that out um, and control at a very precise uh, vacuum level, we have a bleed valve that's computer controlled and is slowly bleeding in dry nitrogen or air to balance that out and to give us a fixed uh, vacuum level that we've targeted. Then a data recording device. Um, when I got my start in the industry, uh, data recording was done by about 10 different colored pens that slowly swept along uh, chart paper that ran along during the process. And at the end of the day, uh, or end of three or four day cycle, you'd have a chart that was, you know, 100 feet long and, and you know, very difficult to, to determine, you know, what transitions you were seeing because it was so spread out. Today, with modern technology, we are using uh, you know, collecting all that on a computer so we can display everything on one page and then the transitions, which we'll show you in, in a further slide, make a lot more sense. Basic components of a freeze dryer. Um, this is what's called an external condenser freeze dryer, so a separate chamber for the samples, a separate chamber for the condenser uh, coil or plate. In this case, it's a coil. You'll see the separate chamber here. They're connected by a tube, uh, what we call the throat. Most cases, we're going to have a valve in here, generally a butterfly valve, that we can open and close. Uh, one of the tri tick, uh, uh, things that we can use during cycle development to help us understand uh, the end point of primary drying. Um, you'll see the samples sitting here. They are on shelves. There's a thermal fluid, generally silicon oil, that pumps through those shelves that we can control the temperature of through a heat exchanger. The vacuum uh, comes through the condenser chamber. Um, in this particular case, this is a unit that would be used for uh, sterile product manufacturing, so it is steam sterilizable as you see the steam inlet. Uh, 
This is an image of one of the development units in our lab. Same basic components, vacuum pump, um, condenser coil, chamber, uh, sample chamber with temperature controlled shelves. What you don't see behind this is a tube that connects the sample chamber of the condenser coil. Uh, one of the things that sets this unit apart is our sample feed. So during development, we're going to be pulling samples at various time points to monitor various things, potency, purity, residual moisture more importantly, and we can do that without stopping the cycle. This is a commercial scale unit, um, uh, probably about uh, almost close to, you know, I don't know, 10, 12 feet in height. Um, so when we scale up to something like this, it's really important for uh, the development scientists to, to make sure they have a robust cycle before they transfer in here. I mean, I've seen issues where if we don't do a good job developing a cycle or just try to you know, transfer in uh, seamlessly, sometimes we get collapsed products, sometimes we get broken vials, shattered glass. Um, so these are surprises we don't want when we you know, transfer to a manufacturing environment. This just shows you a breakdown here of freeze drying in relation to the total manufacturing process. So freeze drying of a one day cycle eats up about 4% in this particular case of the manufacturing process. When we go to a cycle that runs four days, that's when we start to see issues here with freeze drying now eating up 10% of the manufacturing costs. So this really highlights why it's important to run an optimized process. Um, you know, we have clients that come to us and they say, we've got a two-week cycle. Um, it's not uh, scientifically justified. That's just, uh, we don't know where the cycle came from. And that's where we get into some of the thermal characterization, which we'll talk about a little bit later and then in further uh, webinars, and say, well, you know, if you understand the science or the, the chemistry behind your formulation, the thermal properties, we can actually go in and reduce some of that time so you're not, you know, running a two-week cycle when you could be running a three-day cycle and still get, um, you know, the same quality of product, the same potency, purity, moisture meets all of your release specifications. So freeze drying, We've got to talk about water or another solvent. So without water, uh, obviously living things cease to exist or go dormant in the case of uh, spore forming bacteria. Um, water can, in, however, induce damage, and that's why we freeze dry. We don't want to freeze dry. We freeze dry because, because we have to. Um, in the pharmaceutical industry, diagnostic, tissue, plants, uh, foods, we freeze dry to minimize damage due to water through a chemical process called hydrolysis. NASA uh, will freeze dry different components to reduce weight uh, when they uh, ship things into outer space. So we do it to reduce damage to our products. Uh, spoilage and growth promotion, obviously, if things remain wet out in the normal environment, uh, they can go bad. Now, the effects of water can be immobilized or eliminated um, by freezing the product. And we've had several clients that have come to us with their product and said, um, we don't want to freeze dry it. It's fine. We're going to formulate it. We're going to freeze it and that's going to be our product. The problem comes to be is that as soon as the product's manufactured, it's got to be frozen. It's got to be kept frozen throughout the entire process of shipping and storage at the end for the end user, and that becomes problematic with shipping, shipping and handling. So freeze drying is a remedy for that. We eliminate those issues by, by freeze drying the product. Uh, the effects of water can be slowed down by adding a high salt content or a high sugar content. Uh, if you think about curing meats, um, which, again, is, is typically not a good environment for, for certain molecules. So we try to avoid those, those situations. A little bit of history of freeze drying. Um, freeze drying has been going on for, for thousands of years. The uh, Eskimos and Vikings used to do this. They preserved their fish by catching the fish, letting them freeze solid outside, and then setting them somewhere outside in, in the sun. And over the process of a couple of months, um, sublimation would occur, freeze drying would occur to remove the water from the fish uh, in a low humidity environment and, and they'd be dry and, and good for long-term storage. Some of the uh, additional history, so freeze drying uh, kind of occurred uh, informally in different labs throughout the years after that, but in 1935, uh, two gentlemen, Mudd and Flossdorf, developed a freeze dryer and a process to aseptically or sterilely freeze-dry blood plasma 
for the World War II battlefield. So you think about World War I, before they had this technology, um, a soldier would get injured on the battlefield with a pretty much a superficial wound that could be um, you know, treated immediately and save, you know, be fine, but they would actually bleed out before they could get them back to a field hospital. So the development of freeze-dried plasma allowed them to uh, reach the soldier, administer this uh, uh, plasma to keep the blood volume up, to get them stabilized, they could transfer them back to a field hospital and ta-da, they'd be saved. And freeze-drying then became an art. There was absolutely very, very little, if any, science known behind what was going on with freeze-drying. Um, and it was really in the later last 25 years that we've really tried to understand what uh, some of the science behind freeze-drying. And again, this webinar is set up to be, as we move along through, through the uh, four series, to get more involved in the science, talk about you know, the characterization of the formulation, a little bit of formulation development for a freeze-dried product and moving into cycle design based around those scientific, um, the scientific uh, understanding that we have about our formulation. So why do we freeze-dry? Well, because we have to. The product is not stable. So if we make it up in a liquid formulation, uh, it degrades uh, relatively quickly. So our goal as development scientists is to get at least two years of stability or see less than 10 percent degra degradation um, at controlled room temperature for at least two years. Again, that's my goal in liquid. If it's not going to make it, which we should understand through early uh, stability studies, then we would look at freeze-drying as an option to increase the stability of that. Freeze-drying is compatible with many aseptic operations. Um, again, it's, it's easy to formulate and sterile fill a liquid. Um, the drying takes place, like I mentioned before, at low temperatures, so compared to conventional oven drying, we minimize thermal degradation of our samples. Um, we have very precise control of filling our products. Um, so we fill products that are you know, accurate down to 100 uh, microliters, so that technology is very well understood. So some of the limitations of freeze drying, some, dr some drugs just do not freeze dry well and actually degrade during freeze drying. Many cephalosporins fall into this category. Uh, also many biologically based molecules, your monoclonal antibodies, your uh, proteins uh, are damaged through freeze drying or can be damaged through freeze drying. So how we freeze dry uh, the product and a formulation aspect both come in helping to stabilize those molecules. And then not all molecules or materials can be freeze dried to form a pharmaceutically elegant or acceptable product. It just looks terrible. That's not to say we can't put that product on the market. It's stable, it's effective, it's you know, long-term stability, it just looks terrible. Um, so again, uh, it kind of comes down to the argument between the development folks and the marketing folks about what we're putting on the market. And then obviously cost. Freeze drying adds to the cost of a product. What can be freeze dried? Small molecule. When I got my start in the industry, everything was small molecule with a few large molecules popping in here and there. Now that's sort of changed a little bit. We're seeing a lot more larger molecules. I mean, vaccines, enzymes, hormones, blood products, monoclonal antibodies. Even I've worked on several tissues for surgery. Um, so pretty much everything under the sun now that, that potentially can be freeze dried. Um, somebody has tried to freeze dry it. Uh, yeah, even uh, animals. So taxidermy is becoming a larger part of the freeze drying uh, community. Um, so absolutely, get the moisture out. Um, some of the things that can't be freeze dried, anything with a lot of oil in it. Sugar rich products, we can freeze dry these. However, uh, as we'll talk uh, in a few slides, you know, the glass transition temperature of some of these is a little bit limiting. Um, so we try to avoid, a, you know, a lot of sugar. Products that form an impervious skin. So when we freeze something down, sometimes we get phase separation uh, of the product and we get you know, a layer that forms on top that is essentially a skin. And when we try to freeze dry, the water that's down below has trouble punching through the skin and it makes very it you know, very difficult to get that water vapor out. High salt containing products, not that we can't form a, a decent sized cake, or decent structure, physical structure, with a, a high salt containing product. The problem comes to be is anything with a glass transition, you know, anything, uh, a protein, a sugar, the salt is going to really suppress that and lower the glass transition temperature and then it's much more difficult to freeze dry. Okay, this is a phase diagram of water. Now we all know that water changes phase. 
as a function of temperature. Below zero, it's a solid. Below 100 degrees and above zero, it's a, a, a liquid. Above 100 degrees, it forms steam or goes into a vapor. What a lot of people don't know is that we can also change phase by simply changing the pressure in the, in the, in the chamber. Okay, so we can put a, a room temperature sample of water into a chamber, draw a very high vacuum, and get that, get that water to boil at room temperature, and then freeze. Okay, so what we're doing in freeze drying is basically removing the water from the, the, the product, or taking the ice crystals going directly from a solid to a vapor. That's what sublimation is. So if we look at our phase diagram here, um, assume we're at, uh, let's see, 25 degrees C, which is ambient temperature, one atmosphere pressure, which is ambient pressure, and we start to cool that sample down. Well, we know we go from the liquid to the solid, so we're sitting here down in the solid state at atmospheric pressure. Then we create a vacuum, okay, or decrease the pressure. Now we're still in the solid state. Well, what happens if we start to warm that sample? Well, we warm that sample and at a certain temperature. We start to see an increase in the, the the ice crystals going from the solid state to the vapor state. That's sublimation, skipping the liquid state entirely. So what we're left with after the, after the fact is a, a dried solid that looks like what we had when we were frozen. Now it's got a lot of tiny little pores in it where the ice crystals used to reside, which is fine because that actually acts as a source of uh, you know, reconstitution. So when we add water, it finds all those little crannies and, and holes and helps reconstitute the product when we were ready to use it. So while alkalization works, sublimation, that's the chemistry version of uh, changing directly from the solid state to the vapor state, the gaseous state, without going through the liquid state. There's a psychological term, which I hadn't heard of until I did some research for this webinar, but um, yeah, the chemistry term, sublimation, solid to a vapor. Now I'm going to read this next statement, and then we'll sit and think about it. So ice sublimes or goes from the solid to the vapor state in an attempt to achieve vapor equilibrium. Okay? When the chamber pressure equals the ice vapor pressure, sublimation stops. Now let's talk about what that, what that, term, what that means. Everything has a vapor pressure. Um, so say, for example, I take a vial of water. Okay? Um, I put a, uh, a sensor in the top of the vial to measure changes in pressure, then I put a lid on it. What we would see is the head space or the air above the water would show us a rise in pressure higher than the outside air. The reason for that, the water molecules on the surface are going into the vapor state or leaving the surface and increasing the pressure. That's its vapor pressure. Um, let's talk about, say, a vial of alcohol. We do the same experiment. Vial of alcohol, pressure sensor in the top, put a lid on it. The pressure of the, uh, the vial with uh, alcohol is going to be higher. It's more volatile. It's easier for those molecules to escape from the surface of the liquid and go into the headspace, so we'd see a higher pressure. So ethanol or any other alcohol has a higher vapor pressure than water. Now let's think about if we heated these up. Okay? How, does, how does vapor pressure change as a function of temperature? And anybody knows when you heat something up in a closed system, the pressure rises, and it can explode if we don't relieve that pressure. So vapor pressure is very dependent on temperature. We'll talk more about that as we go as well. So what we're trying to do in a freeze dryer chamber is at the sublimation front where we have the ice, we're creating all this vapor, okay? Vapor well, ice also has a vapor pressure, so it's not just liquids. Ice has a vapor pressure where it goes from a solid to a vapor, okay? So at the, at the sublimation front, we're creating all this vapor. In the chamber or further out, we need to keep a low pressure because it's a high pressure at the sublimation front, low pressure somewhere else. So by, a, by gradient, the water vapor will naturally migrate from a high pressure source to a low pressure source and take the, take the vapor away from the product. Boiling point, these all go back to the phase diagram of water. These are all affected by vapor pressure. Um, again, um, for those of you who have uh, ever baked a, a, a cake from the store in a box, you read the instructions and it says uh, bake at this temperature for this amount of time, or if you're in the, in the, high, the mountains at higher elevation, you need to bake at this temperature for this time. Because it changes the boiling point of water, so, so again, pressure does have an effect on all of these factors. Boiling point, melting point, 
These are all colligative properties. Triple point, I didn't mention this. Um, precise temperature where pressure where, and pressure where water, vapor, ice, and liquid, all of those, exist in equilibrium. So I'm going to go back to this phase diagram here real quick. So there's different combinations here of where liquid and vapor exist in equilibrium. So we change pressure and temperature, and we can ride this line. So there's different values or combinations of temperature and pressure where we can exist in equilibrium. However, for a solid liquid vapor to ex exist in equilibrium, there's only one pressure and one temperature where those all exist. That's 0 degrees Celsius and 4.5 millimeters of mercury. So I love this slide because it really shows us why we want to be running an optimized process in freeze drying. So in this particular case, we know the vapor pressure, okay? The ice converting to vapor or the liquid, you know, going to vapor. Um, we know it's a function of temperature. But what I'm saying to you here, it's actually an exponential function of temperature. So if we're down here and say we want to freeze dry at negative 40, okay, my vapor pressure is probably somewhere around 100. So vapor pressure, again, is how quickly things go from the, the liquid or the solid state into the vapor state. However, if we can freeze dry at negative 20, wow, that's 10 times faster, 10 times higher the vapor pressure, or 10 times higher the sublimation rate, or 10 times faster this is going to dry. So this is why you know, a lot of the work that we do at our facility here is clients come to us and they say, wow, we've got this product that's taking us two weeks to freeze dry and it's really eating to our, uh, you know, adding up on our manufacturing costs. What can we do? Well, we understand, well, why are you, if you're freeze drying at 45, yes, it's going to be slow. If you can freeze dry at negative 20, you know, we can speed that process up 10 times and instead of spending two weeks in the freeze dryer, you spend two or three days and you get the same product. So this is what future webinars are going to talk about, is understanding, you know, that critical temperature, where we can safely freeze dry, you know, run the warmest we can so it's going to dry as fast as it can, but also not running too warm where you talk about collapsing the product or damaging the product. All right, some of the steps of freeze drying that we'll talk about, um, product freezing one and two, we'll talk more about that in the next webinar. So we've got to get the product frozen. Thermal treatment, if we have to do an annealing step. Um, once everything's frozen, we kick on our vacuum pump. Technically, we're then in primary drying. Now, the goal or the role of primary drying is to remove the frozen ice in the product. We have ice crystals that form. So primary drying is when all the frozen ice is gone, and technically, when all the ice is gone, we are in secondary drying. And this is where we remo remove the unfrozen water. Um, so um, this is water that's loosely associated in the different phases, which we'll get into in a future webinar. And we basically conduct primary drying until um, we reach our target moisture, whatever that may be. We then backfill with an inert gas or air in some cases, seal the product, or if we're, we're drying in bulk, we'll take that pan and put it in a, a controlled, uh, uh, controlled humidity environment. Different phases of freeze drying. So in this particular case, we've loaded the shelf with the product at room temperature. Shelf is frozen to negative 40 degrees C. These are thermocouple probes in the product. We watch the product temperature go down. We see it nucleate here. Um, finally, we get to the point where we say the product's frozen, and then we kick on the vacuum pump here, which is this line coming down. Once we're at full vacuum, we're, or once we hit vacuum, um, we're technically in primary drying where we're converting the ice from the solid to the vapor. You'll notice product temperature here and shelf temperature are very different. Okay, So in primary drying where we you know, typically freeze the product low temperature, and then we ramp up to a predetermined shelf temperature here. In this case, it's plus 40, and you'll notice product temperature is running very cold. Um, this is not unusual. We see this all the time in freeze drying. A couple of reasons this is happening is that the process of sublimation itself is an endothermic process, so conversion of the, the ice to vapor naturally cools the product. Additionally, um, under high vacuum, this chamber is actually an insulator instead of a, 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 a conductor of heat. So we do see a lot of heat that way. We continue primary drying until it's complete. Product temperature slowly rises. Finally, we get to a point where we say primary drying is done. We ramp the shelf to secondary drying temperatures, hold it there until our moisture level is reached. Now, I will tell you, this is kind of an old graph. Um, 
years ago, it was, it was estimated that um, dropping the chamber pressure in secondary drawing was beneficial, but actually it has no, no effect whatsoever. So uh, you won't see this in a modern printout from a freeze drying process. We pretty much hold at constant uh, chamber pressure in secondary drying. Pharmaceutically elegant product, so this is what we'd like to get when we pull the product out of the freeze dryer. Um, you know, nice white fluffy cake, reconstitutes very quickly, um, doesn't fall apart in the vial. Some of the critical quality and mandatory attributes, I mean, if we're doing injectable drugs, sterile product, it's got to be sterile, free from endotoxin, any particle matter, uh, it's got to recover activity upon reconstitution, and we want to see some, you know, make sure it's stable. Desired quality attributes, we'd like to see it isotonic, physiological, nice look of a uh, cake. If we're doing diagnostics or tissues or foods, again, that, uh, those are things that really, really don't concern us. So sublimation occurs, or converting ice to water vapor, occurs from the top of the frozen layer down to the bottom. So if you've ever watched something freeze dry in a vial in your, in your freeze dryer, you'll notice you'll see the line start to go down from the top of the vial to the bottom. The line in between the frozen layer and the dried layer is what we call the sublimation front. That's where act, act, uh, uh, sublimation is actively occurring. Theoretically, this is what we'd expect. There's our, fro our dried layer, sublimation front, that line, frozen layer. In reality, this is what we see. So we kind of see things come down in a ball due to the temperature here is a little bit warmer on the sides. Uh, so what we're left with at the end of the day before primary drying is done is a small little ball of ice at the bottom of the vial. Um, the difference between the vapor pressure at the sublimation front and at the surface of the condenser is the driving force of freeze drying. So let's think about that. We've got a very high pressure event at the sublimation front, so we're converting ice to vapor, high pressure. Surface of the condenser, we have a low pressure event because anything gets near it will freeze and stick to the condenser. So that delta P, change in pressure between the sublimation front and the condenser, is the driving force of freeze drying, and that's what keeps water vapor flowing to the condenser. Freeze drying with alternate solvents, generally we do this for solubility issues or stability issues. What we've worked with in the past is um, mostly ethanol if we're doing injectable drugs or uh, T-butyl alcohol if we're making diagnostics or whatever else, it's kind of the wild west, we can get away with using pretty much everything under the sun as long as it doesn't uh, damage components of our freeze dryer. Okay, we're going to wrap this up uh, with temperature and vacuum sensors and talk about those and why those are important. So accurately controlling and monitoring both temperature and pressure in our system is critical. And there's various points in the chamber where we're going to measure these things. So we'll go ahead and talk about that. Um, in the next couple of slides. So some of the temperature sensors we can use or have been used are a resistance temperature detector or an RTD, um, thermocouples, um, again this is what we're currently using um, as the main source or the most modern form of temperature sensing both in product and different components in the freeze dryer, and then something called a thermistor which we'll touch on as well. Some of the vacuum sensors, hopefully nobody's using these, but I have gone to companies where we've seen uh, people using these things, and uh, you know, it's, it's definitely old technology, and obviously with the issues of mercury, we don't like to see that. Mostly what we're seeing are a thermal conductivity gauge, a special version of that is called a Pirani gauge, and then coupled with a capacitance manometer. So the capacitance manometer, which we'll talk more about, is the modern gauge that most people are using in freeze drying. Some of the things that we want to look at in regards to both of these sensors are the range of effectiveness that we can read in both. How repeatable are they? How accurate are they? What's the stability? Are they linear? Are they interchangeable? Uh, how quickly do they provide a response time? Uh, how cheap are they? So these are all things we want to consider. So let's first talk about RTDs, resistance temperature detectors. So basically this type of detector, it's a wire, typically a platinum wire. And we put a current, we plug it in and put a current across it. Well, as we change the temperature of that wire, the resistance to that current flow will change. So they're able to correlate that back to uh, a change in temperature. Pretty easy stuff. Um, what you'll typically see is a platinum wire wrapped around a ceramic core and then covered in a glass sheet. And basically we put this whole unit into um, an area we want to measure temperature and we 
read the temperature based on, again, the resistance to current flow as the temperature of the wire changes. Some of the advantages, you know, they're accurate, very repeatable and stable through a very high temperature range. They have a high output, so as we see a voltage drrop, um, you know, we see a, or a temperature drop, we get a large voltage drop. These things are dirt cheap, and there's many different configurations that we can use. Some of the disadvantages, they are self-heating, which is one of the things we don't like. So when we put an RTD in the sample, it will warm itself up a little bit and sort of change its environment. So we, we, that's one of the downsides of this. The other issue is the result that we get, the temperature result, is an average over the entire length of the, of the sensor. So we can measure, a, uh, if we're trying to do a point sensing of temperature, we can't do it with this. It's essentially an average of the entire uh, range or the entire area of where it's being placed. Thermocouples, most widely used. It's basically two wires now. Instead of one wire, it's two wires that are TIG welded or fine welded to a point between the two wires. And then it's the same issue. We put a current across the wires, measure the resi or look at the resistance drop, the voltage drop, um, and correlate it back to temperature. Most widely used. Uh, the revolting voltage is a function of the difference, again, of the temperature between the, at the tip only. So this, if we want to measure a point, this is the way to go. And, and again, actually we do. Uh, typical thermocouples we might see, um, again, tip sensing. These are copper constantan. We'll talk about that. They come in different wire gauges. Again, we like using these. They're a little easier to manipulate. Our friends at SP Industries, SP Scientific, sell these nice little devices that help you place the thermal couples properly, which we'll talk more about. Again, we'll say more about it. We like to have the thermal couple just touching the bottom of the vial in the center of the vial. Components, again, what we use in the pharmaceutical industry is what's called a type T. Um, copper and constant tan is what we're working with. There's others for different ranges of temperature, different applications. The type T is what we work with. Some of the advantages um, compared to the RTD, fast response. We can get two to three milliseconds of data, not that we'd ever want to collect that. Um, they're very rugged, resist mechanical shock. We have a wide temperature range. They are point sensing, which we like, and they are not, not self-heating. So the temperature we're reading is accurate. Okay? Some of the disadvantages, less repeatable, less stable compared to an RTD, they do give a nonlinear response, which makes calibration important. Um, very accurate, they have wide air, uh, they don't have very wide air limits compared to an RTD. So you'll see here when we graph, this is actually the, the uh, x-axis here is the function of temperature, and you can see the RTD is very linear throughout the entire temperature range. These are nonlinear, so it becomes very important on calibration of those. Again, I mentioned that the thermocouple is point sensing, so we're only measuring temperature at that point, whereas the RTD is measuring temperatures throughout the entire range of that probe. I'll say a little bit about the thermistor. Um, it's a class of semiconductors, typically made of nickel, cobalt, magnesium oxides. The resistance varies sharply with a temperature change, so these are extremely, extremely sensitive to temperature changes. See, it looks like a thermocouple, point measuring. The advantages compared to the RTD, highly, highly sensitive. Okay, so these can measure very, very tiny changes in temperature. Uh, we don't need a reference. Sensitivity actually increases with decreasing temperature. So as we go down in temperature, these become more sensitive. Some of the disadvantages, the big disadvantage, nonlinear response, and it's an exponential nonlinear response. So very hard to keep in calibration. High variation in resistance. They're non-interchangeable, uh, narrow, narrow temperature range where the calibration is stable, so we try to stay away from those in pharmaceuticals. Thermocouple placement, we talked about that, just touching the bottom in the center of the vial. Not good, perfect right in the center, and that's a little bit hovering off the, the bottom of the vial. We want to make sure these are placed correctly. Okay, let's uh, wrap up here with pressure vacuum measurement. As with temperature, monitoring and controlling the pressure and vacuum level is very critical to get a good product. Mercury manometer, again, I'm not going to say too much about this because hopefully nobody's using those, although I have gone to companies uh, consulting, and they do have mercury manometers all over the place. This is called a McLeod gauge. Um, 
mercury manometer, again, the, the downside, of, uh, I mean, the upside is we don't have to calibrate it. The downside is it's, you know, full of mercury. Low maintenance, simple to use. Again, large volume of mercury. It's a single point measurement. We can't track the data. You can't record it unless you're standing there with a pen and pencil, uh, pen or pencil writing everything down. Thermal conductivity gauge. This is older technology, but this is the original technology after the, the mercury manometer. Basically, it's what's called a hot wire gauge. So we'll take a heated wire, put it in the chamber. Now, at atmospheric pressure, we've got a lot of molecules floating around in our, in our environment. Water vapor, carbon dioxide, oxygen, argon, nitrogen. These molecules are banging into this hot wire, taking some heat away from us. Um, when we go into a vacuum, or low pressure, we pull out a lot of those molecules, and it takes less heat away. So we're able to correlate that heat loss and correlate it back to pressure in the chamber. I'm not going to go through some of these equations. Um, heat loss due to conduction and freeze drying. Energy loss, there's a little bit loss due to radiation. Um, some points to note, energy loss by conduction increases linearly with pressure, fine. Um, that's all I'm going to say about that. The thing with this type of gauge, one of the issues with it, it requires a constant gas composition. So you think about a water molecule versus a nitrogen molecule versus an argon molecule. When it hits this hot wire gauge, it's going to carry away a different amount of heat. Okay, so it's going to give you a different reading if it's in nitrogen, water vapor, carbon dioxide. Now I will tell you, these types of sensors, the Pirani gauge, is calibrated in nitrogen. So we'll talk more about that as we go. The other issue is these do not do well under clean-in-place or steam-in-place conditions. So if you're using a pro, uh, freeze dryer to make sterile product, odds are you're going to have some issues keeping those things from being, becoming damaged. Thermal conductivity gauge is not completely linear, but typically in the range we work with, it's linear, so mostly linear. So again, we have to make sure and um, calibrate these things correctly. There's the Pirani gauge. Again, the hot wire exposed to the elements. Capacitance manometer, this is the modern vacuum sensor that we're using and controlling our process. Basically, this is a flexible metal diaphragm. On one side is a locked chamber or fixed of a fixed pressure. On the other side, it's open to the freeze-drying chamber. And as we create a vacuum, that diaphragm will fluctuate. Well, part of the uh, capacitance equation has to do with a um, shape function. So as we change the shape of that uh, diaphragm, we change the capacitance across that cell, and we can correlate that back to a change in vacuum. Again, I mentioned that a flexible metal diaphragm. Here you see an image of it. Here's atmospheric pressure. Here's where we're under a vacuum. It distorts that, results in a change across the capacitance of that cell. Some of the advantages of this, it's independent of gas composition. It doesn't care if it's nitrogen, oxygen, water vapor, um, whatever. It's going to give you an accurate, correct reason. So modern freeze drying uses the capacitance manometer as a means to control the process. So this is the data it's you know, bleeding back or sending back to the freeze dryer that says, you know, open the, open the bleed valve, close the bleed valve to, to balance out that, uh, that pressure value. Very good sensitivity. It's accurate. Um, this thing can be steam in place and, and cleaned in place without any issues of damage to it. Some of the errors or disadvantages, uh, high temperature effects, we're never going to take this thing more than what is prescribed in a freeze dryer. We never overpressurize it. They can withstand some pressure. I mean, if we're steam, you know, doing a steam in place, steam sterilization, we are going to pressurize it a little bit, but you know, you don't want to do it over that or you could damage the cell. Locations. So we've got temperature sensors and vacuum sensors throughout the chamber. Thermal fluid inlet, thermal fluid outlet, which are we monitoring, which are we using to control the process. Temperature probes, we've got a probe somewhere measuring the, uh, the temperature of the condenser. On the big units, there's all kinds of probes throughout the, throughout the uh, unit that are measuring temperature of the different systems in the freeze dryer. Same thing with the vacuum gauges. So we may have, you know, especially on the development freeze dryer, we may have a prani gauge and a capacitance manometer, both measuring pressure, both in the sample chamber and the condenser chamber, giving us different pieces of information. OK, and with that, that's our basic uh, introduction to freeze drying. I will open the floor back up to Audrey, and then we will uh, take some questions. OK, thanks, Jeff. Yep, uh, everybody, if you just want to uh, ask any questions, I'm going to 
pull out the questions box over here to the left. So feel free to type a question if you have it, and we'll wait a few minutes um, and see if anybody wants to ask anything. All right, looks like we have our first question coming in. Okay, you mentioned that the sublimation front is curved. Is it applicable for both primary and secondary drawing? What are the differences? Well, so in, there's no sublimation front in secondary drawing. So when primary drawing is done, all the sublimation of ice is complete. So yeah, we see that um, sublimation front come down as a sphere essentially at the end of drawing. But in secondary drawing, um, all that's gone, and we're just removing residual moisture from the product. So there would be no sublimation front associated with that. Uh, next question, what are the key parameters specific to antibody lyophilization? Boy, that's a big, big question for uh, an introduction. Um, it's, it's, it's numerous. Um, you know, it, it's all dependent on the stability of the molecule. I mean, when we develop a formulation for a client for, say, a, a, an antibody or a monoclonal uh, antibody, big pro, large protein. I mean, it, it, it's all based on a, a fixed process. We do the pre-formulation, we find the conditions where it's most stable in the liquid state, then we start free thawing it. We may balance it out with a stabilizer. Um, so basically, we want to develop the most stable formulation we can in the liquid state, then we start beating it up with free thaw, add stabilizers or change things in, you know, in free thaw, then we start freeze drying it to make sure it's the most stable. Um, so there's really no good answer because everything's different. I mean, the only commonality I can tell you is that a good stabilizer is going to be like a sucrose or a trellose that we use. Um, also, in, in secondary drying, we typically don't like to go higher than 25 to 30 degrees Celsius at product temperature. Um, but other than that, I mean, you, you key parameters, make sure your formulation is well-developed for a freeze-dried product, so stabilizers, absolutely. You know, uh, the, the proper pH, the proper tonicity, proper stabilizers in regards to freeze-drying, proper temperatures of, of developing the cycle and not going too warm during secondary drying. Uh, what are the sh why is that sugars are hard to freeze-dry? Well, the you know, they're not necessarily hard to freeze-dry. It's the glass transition temperature of these things is relatively low. You know, it's not out of the ballpark, but the glass transition temperatures of most of the sugars that we use for stabilization are about negative 32, negative 33. So by the time we you know, give a little bit of buffer, you know, we're freeze drying at negative 37, negative 38. So it just lowers the glass transition temperature. And like I mentioned, the lower temperature we freeze dry, um, the harder it is, or the, the longer it takes to freeze dry. Because the lower the temperature, the lower the vapor pressure, the lower the sublimation rate, Therefore, these are going to dry a lot slower. So it's not that they're hard to freeze dry. It's just it's going to take more time. Next question, why reading from the Prani and the capacitance manometer are different during primary drying until the end? Great question. So this is a tool that we use in our development dryers. So like I mentioned, the, Prani, the, the capacitance manometer is going to read accurately at set point throughout the entire process. The Prani gauge is going to be thrown off because it's calibrated with nitrogen, but what we're actually getting in the chamber in primary drying is water vapor, okay? So it's throwing the set point off. So the prony gauge is always going to run higher. Um, what happens is as primary drying goes to completion, now there's not a, you know, the water vapor is decreasing, so it's bleeding in more nitrogen, which the gauge was calibrated with nitrogen, so it starts to read set point. So you'll see the prony gauge, let's see if I can capture this, uh, the prony gauge running higher, and then at the end of primary drying, the prony gauge starts to drip, uh, drop, and they, so they both start reading accurate set points. So we use that in development to help us understand the end point of primary drying. Good question. Okay, I'll give it another minute or two to see if anybody else wants to ask anything. All right, we've got another one coming in. For tray lyophilization, to increase, to increase throughput, what materials would you recommend for trays? Well, that's a great question. Um, 
I mean, really, you could you could use any type of tray. Um, mostly, what folks are using are stainless steel. Um, there are some trays that are like plastic trays with a very thin um, polymer bottom on those. Um, Basically, what it's going to come down to is optimizing um, your process for um, product temperature and chamber pressure. You know, it doesn't matter if we're drying in a, an aluminum, a stainless steel tray, or something with a very thin plastic body. And they're all going to have different heat transfers, but as long as you get the product temperature to where it needs to be, again, from your thermal characterization study, it won't matter. I mean, stainless steel trays are probably the method of choice because they're essentially indestructible. They're going to sit flat. I mean. Plastic trays with a thin bottoms are more disposable, so it, it's, it's whatever you want to use. So I don't look at the type of container that we freeze dry in. We just have to understand the parameters of the freeze dryer to get the product at the ultimate uh, the, the temperature, the ultimate temperature, critical temperature that we determine through our thermal characterization studies. So it's kind of up company to company. One question: annealing temperature. How could I achieve it? Well, we determine if a product needs to be annealed. Through our, th through our thermal characterization study. So when a sample comes into our lab for testing from a client, we do the DSC, we do the freeze dry microscope. That gives us several key pieces of information. Number one, is it a glassy phase with a glass transition? Is it a eutectic crystalline phase? Does it need to be annealed? So we can actually see that on our DSC. Um, so basically what we do is we determine what that temperature needs to be we can actually run an annealing step on our DSC and then duplicate that on a freeze dry microscope. How do we achieve it? Well, annealing is technically part of the freezing phase, so it's done at atmospheric pressure. So basically, we freeze our sample solid, so cool it down to negative 40, negative 45, hold it till equilibration, and we warm it back up to our annealing temperature, which we've determined through thermal characterization, and then hold it there for a fixed amount of time. Then we cool it back down, to our freezing temperature, and then we kick on our vacuum to start primary drying. Okay, so if we have no uh, more questions, I'd just like to thank everyone for your attendance and participation in today's webinar, and uh, extend a special thank you to Dr. Schwegman for volunteering his time. And if you've missed any part of today's session, I'd like to remind you that a copy of the presentation as well as a recording will be available on the SP Scientific LioLearn webinar archives within 48 hours. And, and I would also say, Audrey, I'm sorry, I would also say if there's any questions too, they're, they're more than, uh, uh, I'm more than willing to action them. They can email me or give me a call if there's any questions outside of the webinar as well. Okay, great. And uh, this is your contact information here on the slide yep. we're seeing. So we hope that you do join us for part two of this webinar series on Wednesday, August 29th. Other than that, thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.